Our next guest speaker, uh, he's an antique expert, antique jewelry expert. He has been on the highest end of the jewelry industry, dealing with antiques, with private collectors, with royalty, and um, he's also an ICA director. He's the chairman of the uh, communications committee of the ICA. He's Greek, that's why his company is called Gemo Lithos, which is gemstones and rocks. Please, a world, a war, uh, this is, I'm not an English native of the language, so sometimes I get it wrong. Please clap, clap for Ioannis Alexandris. Welcome to the stage. Thank I thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I want to thank uh, the president of DMCC and also the president of ICA, but also all the people that work behind this uh, uh, to make this Congress happen. Uh, a big applause actually goes to them because without their work, this Congress would not be uh, possible. So um, also, I want to thank um, you that you make this Congress happen, uh, all the attendees attendees. So we're going to start today and we're going to go back as far as uh, 6,000 years ago. Uh, why it is important to know um, the history and lore behind the jewelry. Um, yesterday was very motivating to hear that um, the new generation wants to hear this. They eager to learn more about it. They want to know the lore, the history, where the stones are coming, why they, are, they have this symbolism, why they have this color, why this and why that. Not so much about the clarity and not so much about um, the techniques, etc., but more the, the story behind it. And that's very motivating. So, the Sumerian. Sumerian uh, civilization is, uh, is uh, for, for many people, for many professionals also, the cradle of the civilization. Um, what is distinctive in this, uh, in this uh, civilization, in jewelry and the stones? Um, they are the first that they were using high quality techniques to produce jewelry and also gemstones. Gemstone, uh, minerals, com minerals coming and gemstones coming from Afga lapis lazuli from Afghanistan, carnelian from India. And that happened uh, 4000 BC. So, you can imagine how important that is, and I was the, the first that uh, started the cryptography. Cryptography is um, the, um, uh, when you have a stone, the intaglio that you, you carve, but in a very, very primitive way. We're going to talk about it later, but this, is, uh, the, this civilization was the first to introduce this. The Egyptians. Um, very important, I'm sure you know Tutankhamun and I'm sure you know the mask of Tutankhamun, but what is behind it and why I choose this one? Um, the Egyptians were the first to introduce and to use symbolism behind the jewelry. Color symbolism more. Uh, blue for sky, green for, um, for good energy, and red, blood, um, for uh, for uh, vitality, so every single piece of jewelry of them, it's uh, it's not only a story, but it's a symbolism behind it. Of course, you know about the mines of uh, of uh, Cleopatra, the emerald mines of Cleopatra, but this comes very very uh, uh, long long after uh, from this mask. This mask is uh, dated around uh, nine uh, one thousand three hundred uh, around three hundred uh, one thousand three hundred twenties. So you can imagine how advanced were the techniques. And in saying that, in the next slides, you will see some jewelry and ge with gemstones. The gemstones, you have to um, completely put a zero on your mindset, judging the gemstones of these periods. But take a higher critical eye on the techniques of the, of the, of the jewelry. Another important civilization were the Phoenicians. Phoenicians, um, started with the granulation. They are the first that they were using cabochon stones, the cutting of cabochons. Also the beads are finer, not 
uh, of course, the, the bids were used was, were being used before uh, by by Egyptians, but not as fine uh, as the Phoenicians. Uh, here, an example with amethyst, with amethyst and uh, gold. You see in the middle the cabochon and also the and also the fine bead uh, hanging. And we're coming on the Greek civilization. Um, there are different um, different civilizations that, that compose the, the Greek or Hellenistic uh, civilization. There are the Mycenaeans, the Minoans, and there we're coming later to the Hellenistic period. In that period, all this, the simple granulation, and the simple motifs uh, changed completely. Instead of having just a simple hoop as an earring, you have the arrows hanging. You have the use of elaborate stones like emerald and carnelian. You have also the use of uh, more complex designs like the Hercules knot and enamel. Uh, by saying that it's not only the, the knot and the enamel, but also leaves, uh, snakes, uh, other animals, gods, goddesses, all were depicted in the jewelry. And we're coming to the Romans, more advanced. We're, get, we're going to um, not only the techniques, but also the stones. Uh, you see the carvings. Can you imagine that uh, that is from the uh, 700 uh, BC or from the 300 BC or from 50 BC? Uh, the quality is, um, is incredible. Um, and judging it, from the from the carbosom, from the single carbosom, to this in incredible cameo, uh, you see the difference. Also, the carving on the on the face, on the on this um, uh, on the, on this emerald. Byzantine. Constantine was uh, um, made a new um, a new empire. Constantine the first would done a new empire around 330 A.D. Now, the, the trade became um, more uh, widespread. Uh, you have stones coming from all over the world, almost the known world. Sri Lankan surprise that you can see, obviously, emeralds, also from Afghanistan, and also um, or, or the mountains from this region, and carnelian from India, sardonyx from India. And we're coming in the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages is rather a dark period, something that you don't see elaborate jewelry, um, rather, um, rather dull, rather um, jewelry that is not so, uh, so fancy. I know that you see the crown there that, is, uh, that has rubies and sapphires, but it's not such elaborate as the, as the centuries before, as the, the Egyptian uh, uh, mask from Tutankhamun. And more distinctive, the most distinctive piece in this period are the brooches. Brooches were worn as also as pendants, and not only as and, and also in um, in uh, in the garments, um, as uh, as buckles. And you have also the use of many rings, um, usually worn five. Each on each finger, on each finger one. So in all fingers. Enamel, te enamel technique was uh, advanced here, also, and uh, the the picture of the lady is Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth I. I choose this as a transition to the Renaissance, and you will see why. That's another lady uh, from the Renaissance. Um, the most used piece of jewelry in the Renaissance was the pendant, not the brooch. We're changing now. The colors that they were used, that were, they were being used, uh, was more so softer. And you have also, the, for the first time, the use of diamonds. Not in the form that we know, but uh, rather in a table cut and uh, in a more uh, primitive way. So Baroque jewelry. I choose this because it was exactly this time that um, um, 
the rose cut was, uh, was at his peak. In this monstrait, there are several um, ways of rose cut uh, gemstones. Um, it's funny because if you, if you see it like this, you don't realize it, but there are more than 15 different cuts and all rows. At the same time, um, it was the period that the uh, Spaniards uh, found the, or refound the Colombian emerald mines. And uh, at the same period, um, although the, the Mayas had a civilization spanning from 9,000 uh, 9, BC, the peak of their civilization it is exactly in the same period. I choose jade. It was the, jade was most important than gold. It was uh, together with, uh, with uh, lapis, uh, together with turquoise and carnelian, uh, was the most important gems used in this period. And we have another civilization that, is, we, was, that was using the jade as most important um, uh, mean of expressing their, um, uh, their value or their way to show jewelry, Chinese. The first necklace is uh, out of jade, is dated uh, around 3000 BC. The, the most important period on the, on the Chinese jewelry is the Ming period and the Qing period. Uh, pearls, corals, and of course, jade. But the turquoise um, element that you see on the far left to you, it's not turquoise. They're kingfisher's feathers. It was used um, predominantly by the emperor. Uh, only the emperor could wear it, only the emperor, and also in this period, only an emperor could wear certain motifs, like the phoenix, no one else. So, and I will come to the last necklace, to the last necklace on this, on this slide, which was uh, from the um, uh, Barbara Hutton Woolworth, sold in 2014 for about almost $30 million. Um, it, it is not 100% known from where this necklace is coming, but the, it is the finest quality necklace ever appeared um, in auction or in the trade uh, to that date. And uh, it is obviously that um, it must be coming from an emperor. Um, I hope someday we'll find where, it from whom it was coming from. The Islamic world, uh, it was uh, spanning from in the 1700 from the Iberian uh, Peninsula to the Middle East, of course, and also to up to Malaysia. So you have different uh, cultures mixed together, but they have one thing in common. There are no faces. There is the use of calligraphy. The techniques that they were using were the filigree, much enamel, and if you put it as a whole, when is the time that you can differentiate the Islamic jewelry from the, um, from the other jewelry? It was around the 11th century. From that point, you will see jewelry in the same manner. The, the, the pair of earrings are from the 17th century. They are Moroccan and they use um, f very fine emeralds. I cannot say from where they were coming from because unfortunately we cannot do studies when it's a piece of the museum. We will need a certain um, allowance to do this. But I hope one day we can, uh, we can have access to this kind of pieces and we can find out where these uh, emeralds were coming from. Not only this emerald, but also some other uh, gemstones uh, in, uh, in such artifacts. Georgian period. I think the, Georgian, the Georgian period, everybody has in mind, okay, Georgian period, why? It is the, the kings, Georgian, jo the George kings from, uh, from England. But it's not only that, it's the, it's the period of uh, Marie Antoinette, it's the period of George Washington in the United States, it's the period, it's the period where, uh, the, of Mozart. So there is innovation, there's tra much traveling, and there is a, a change of, um, of experiences, of technologies, 
and uh, definitely uh, the trade of gemstones. Um, on, the f on the top, we see uh, a brooch with, uh, with Colombian emeralds tested. On the lower part, the brooch on the left is uh, backed with rose card diamonds and uh, the ring is from a specified garnet. So you can see that um, slowly all these, um, all these gemstones are coming from, from everywhere to Europe. Why? You have, um, you, have the, um, you have Vasco de Gama before, you have um, also Colombo, and you have, of course, um, the Portuguese when they came in Sri Lanka. I think they were in paradise. Uh, finding all these all these gemstones, and they could bring it back to Europe. This in the same manner before. Uh, the the Chinese were importing coral from Italy. Uh, it is not it is it is not until the 19th century that corals were were started to be fished in the Chinese uh, from the Chinese or in the Chinese seas. The Victorian period. The Victorian period is uh, obviously the time that uh, Queen Victoria came in on the throne in 1837 until she died in 1901. Um, there, I will put it two different uh, things that influenced the, the jewelry at that period. The Suez Canal, excavations uh, from uh, in, in Egypt, excavations in uh, Italy, Pompeii, Herculaneum, all this influenced the jewelers, and also um, the Renaissance. You have uh, you have pieces inspired by the Renaissance. You have pieces inspired uh, by the uh, by the, by the uh, excavations, and of course you see it in the jewelry, uh, like in the Petra Petra uh, in micro mosaic. Uh, there is one distinctive person in this period, um, Fortunato Pio Castellani. Castellani. Uh, claim to find to found the granulation technique. Granulation was uh, is a technique. I don't know how many of you you know what granulation is, but I will explain to you. Granulation is there are small bits, uh, soldered officially or the common way in a plate of gold. Now uh, the Etruscans, 900 uh, A.D., they found the way to do this without soldering. Is that possible? Yes, it is possible. So P Fortunato Pio Castellani claimed that he knew, th that, he, that he found this technique, which is uh, not, not uh, proven up to this day, but um, his works are magnificent. Um, not compared, though, to the Etr Etruscans. Other pieces of jewelry are like this. Uh, and that help the new funds of diamonds in Brazil and Africa, of course. You have plenty of diamonds at that time. I know we are in ICA, and I know, and I know this, this is a color stone association, but um, a piece of jewelry uh, has also diamonds. And we have to refer on that because by, by inventing new techniques to cut diamonds, also the techniques for cutting a gemstone were improved. So everything correlates and everything um, lives and goes together in, this, um, uh, in, the, in the history of jewelry. Um, apart from that, in this period was uh, the period that a machine made jewelry um, uh, started to be produced. Was it good or was it bad? Um, in a some way, it was a new innovation of the time. But for many people, many associations later, that was the, the that was the um, uh, let's say the case or the um, the motiv motivation. I wouldn't put it because it say, I would say it nicely. That was the motivation to say, well, we don't know, we don't want the man the, to manufacture in this way. We want, we rather go back to the handmade jewelry because the the machine jewelry were rather a cheap production. Of course, made easy to wear for everybody, but that lacked the the finance and the, um, the structure, the beauty of a handmade jewelry. And saying that, uh, we're coming in the arts and the crafts jewelry. 
exactly at that point was uh, where a team of, um, not a team, jewelers from the, uh, in England, that uh, decided that we have to go out of this. Um, a system of guilds built up, and uh, the, the main focus was one person should design, produce, manufacture the whole jewelry, the whole piece of jewelry. And uh, exactly that made that impossible. It is almost impossible for one person to do everything. And uh, when it comes to marketing, that destroyed, unfortunately, all this effort and all this goodwill to produce this fine jewelry. Um, simultaneously to this, um, uh, to this jewelry, we have the Art Nouveau jewelry. Art Nouveau is rather uh, something, um, uh, all the days I have put it on purpose on the slide so you can have a reference. The Art Nouveau jewelry was something of a fairy tale, like a dream. Um, the, more, the main base was not in the gemstones. They were, not, they were reluctant to use gem, uh, precious gemstones. They were rather accents of these precious, uh, pre precious gemstones. They were more uh, focused on enamel, uh, horn, or bone. Where usually you see bone and, uh, uh, and bone and horn and shells in the very, very primitive piece of jewelry. But they perfected it in, an, in a, a totally different way. It was exactly this period that you have rather, um, let's say, the stars, the celebrities of the jewelers. You have Lalique, of course. You have uh, Georges Fouquet, like the ring of the, uh, on the right bottom to you. And um, both inspired by one person, Sarah Bernard. Sarah Bernard um, uh, was, a, was the, rather the first um, actor, act celebrity actor. Alphonse Mouha created, designed the bracelet, and uh, Georges Fouquet um, created it. The bracelet, is the, the bracelet is the snake bracelet. She wore this in a play of media. Um, you know all what media is, uh, killing the ch his, the, his, her children. So it was rather a cruel piece of jewelry, but a very, very famous one. And a, com a complete different style than the Victorian ones. With that coming in the Edwardian jewelry. Eduard, at, the, at this period, the platinum mines were uh, found. So you have, uh, you have much input of platinums, and then the use of platinum was predominant in every piece of jewelry. Hardly you will see pieces that they use gemstones. You will see more platinum, white platinum with diamonds. The diamonds, not of a high quality. I choose this piece because it's a very unique one. Uh, belong to uh, the Maharani of Kapurthala, and um, since we are here in Dubai, I thought it's better to use this piece of jewelry, showing the high quality of an emerald, um, Colombian emerald, I will say that again, uh, in a piece of a crescent, in, a, in, a f in the form of a crescent. Uh, beautiful piece of jewelry, very unique, um, also because uh, the use of color. Um, now, exactly in this period, there were some forms of jewelry that, uh, that um, um, started to be used and rather not promoted, but uh, starting to imitating uh, the queen. Um, Edwardian period, because of, of course, because of King Edward, but his, uh, his consort was full of jewelry. The, the Satwar uh, necklace were introdu is introduced, and uh, you see her covered in uh, diamonds and, uh, and jewelry. Mm, I choose this uh, photograph because it's a transition from Queen Victoria to, his son, to her son, uh, Edward. And we are coming in the Art Deco period. To me, it is, or for most, for most experts, it is the most complex period of all time. You have influences uh, from, um, uh, from uh, China, from Japan. Um, the big exhibition 1925 uh, took place in Paris. You have uh, the woman after the war 
that they were starting uh, working in uh, pla in uh, in in places that before it was not impossible even to think of. Those women, they, st they, they didn't want it to give other places after the war. So um, there was a huge change. Coco Chanel invented also the, the it, it was exactly, it was at this time that Coco Chanel um, launched the uh, style a la garçon. And you see it in the first picture. So if you compare the, the, the clothing that you have in the Victorian era, and the and the uh, Alagazon uh, straight lines of this of this area is, uh, is a, um, not a not a not an evolution. It's a revolution rather to the to humanity. Um, to mention, of course, uh, Indian uh, the Indian Empire. The Maharajas had a a, a tremendous amount of um, of gemstones and jewelry. Um, it was this period that these Maharajas came to Europe uh, and wanted to trans transform these traditional pieces of jewelry to Art, to, mm, to art Deco uh, jewelry. And this is an example, this is only one example, as dependent uh, on, the, on the far right. Coming up to the 40s. Um, the 40s was the time that um, I think one of the biggest invention in uh, in the jewelry history made the the invisible setting uh, from Van Cleef and Arpels. The first cuts from Cartier were introduced, and uh, you will see the jewelry become more bulkier. The use of gold um, is predominant. Also, the stones are bigger, uh, chunky. I would say um, it was rather a reaction to after the war. Um, than to show the jewelry that you are wearing. And in contrast, you have the 50s. In the 50s, the, um, not only the style, but also the quality of the stones that is getting better. Um, you have rather heavier settings, but the quality of stones is much more superior than before. Not, not, to, not to make the, the, the jewelry from the previous ages uh, inferior, not at all, but the standards are getting uh, stricter. The, the people or the trade are starting to look with a more critical eye on the use of the gems. And that uh, getting to perfection by Harry Winston in the 60s with a light uh, use of settings. And um, uh, of course, stones are getting much, much uh, nicer. The quality is getting more, much better than before. Um, Complementing rather the femininity, the, 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 the femininity. And the 70s, the flower power generation. Um, it was the, the period, I think, starting by the end of the 60s, that gemstones, gemstones started again to have a meaning. Um, the, 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 not the mystical meaning, but um, uh, uh, the, super, the superficial meaning of the, of the gemstones, the use of it, what is behind it, what uh, helps me to carry um, a particular piece of uh, gemstone, why it complements me. Those, uh, those thoughts uh, happen in the, in the 70s. 80s, the bolder, the better, the bigger, the better. Um, the color for the better. I think the, the first necklace is from Paloma Picasso. For Tiffany, the, uh, the, uh, the golden one is from Bulgari. Uh, you see, it's not only one line of gold, but uh, there are four or five of them. So uh, it depicts exactly the, the, the period. And now coming to the, to the 90s. Uh, up to the to our age, uh, we have jewelers uh, that are perfecting the um, the jewelry techniques. Uh, the stones are being used are collecting to to the highest st standards, but you see together with that um, a rather another approach also for minimalism, as the ring uh, for uh, the two rings uh, on the bottom and a rather more elaborate examples. 
Um, the first one is from Jar, and the, the butterflies from, is from Wallace Chan. Um, you see how, what, what the imagination um, can make. Um, I mean, the, the jewelry nowadays, reach, I think, reaches its peak on the imagination. Of course, there's always room for more. But um, I think at, at this point of, uh, of history, we're reaching the, uh, to my, in my opinion, what the highest standards of, uh, of uh, the combination of gem and jewelry together. I want to leave you uh, with, uh, with a video uh, showing an antique piece of prose. Um, that was uh, given uh, by um, His Royal Highness, the late Sayyid Zayed bin Sultan uh, Al Nayyam to Um Kulthum. She was uh, the lighting star of um, of uh, South uh, of Middle East, and what do we call as the Maria Callas of the Arabian world. Uh, I will let you enjoy it. The necklace is from the. It's an India style. And it's from the uh, end of the end of the nineteenth century. Can I have to raise the video? So I want to thank you very much. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. And uh, shukran. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, how could you, in half an hour, make uh, the whole history of jewelry <laughs> from the antiquity until Wallace Chan and Jar? Uh, it was amazing, and we could appreciate, for us that we are, love gemstones, the uh, evolution of the use of gemstones and the styles of cuttings throughout the ages, and that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We don't have time for questions. Sorry, well. Ioannis. We must, must move on. But you make sure, if you find Ioannis around, make sure you um, reach out to him and ask him of his expertise, and maybe on his phone he might show you special pieces as well. So thank you very much. Thank it you It was very a much. pleasure having you with us.